When you know yourself, come on now, and you know the power that God's given you, you know the anointing, you know the favor, you know the call on your life, then you don't have a problem with celebrating somebody else in their greatness. That's just some of the encouragement that you'll hear momentarily from Bishop A. Glenn Brady. At the conclusion of this message, I will tell you how to obtain additional media and resources that will impact your life. Of such, But uh, let's get started with uh, what we have for tonight. Uh, we're going to deal with some orientation. Uh, for some, this might be your first time to the gym conference. Uh, others, uh, you've been here several times. And just so that you can understand a number of things are, that are happening. Now, our theme for the day, uh, for this entire conference, is um, from the pew to performance. And any of you who are in social media, if you want to put anything, use hashtag time for the gym to reflect any of your uh, photos, pictures, or comments that you put on uh, social media so we can all be together. So from the pew to performance. Uh, in fact, uh, Kevin, why don't you sh uh, shut them out again, right, make it a little easier for people to see. Now, <clears throat> as I shared before, we want to deal with an introduction and orientation. In your manuals, make sure you, we've allotted uh, plenty of time for you to do your notes. Now, we don't have tables, but these manuals can be bent in such a way that you still can take notes without necessarily protruding into the person sitting next to you, all right? So we did that specifically that everybody could take notes uh, even as the Lord is inspiring you, so you can make sure you keep in touch with what the Lord is saying. So let's go uh, get started with our orientation and our introduction. First question you might ask is this. Why are you doing this conference? Well, number one, it's not for us to make money. In fact, I pray that we break even, all right? And hopefully you'll help help us to do that. So it's not about that. Number two, it's not about trying to make a name for myself or this church. Uh, God will do that if he so pleases. But we have some people here that are PIP alumni, those that were participants in the Pentecost and Perspective Conference that my pastor, uh, Bishop Wagner, uh, did and we had back in Youngstown, Ohio. How many ever went to a PIP? All right, very good, some of you. So, so Bishop Wagner was one who wanted to share information as well uh, uh, besides trying to hoard it to themselves, all right? And consequently, he had this conference, uh, a working conference, a teaching conference to impact individuals uh, in their ministry. God inspired me to do the same thing here at New Bethel. Uh, because I've been pastor for uh, seven years now. I came here in June of 2009. And in conferences that we have locally, sometimes in our councils, district meetings, even conventions, the emphasis is more on excitement of, of service and, and emotions and, and inspiration and, and you shout and we dance and then when we leave we ask, what did the preacher preach? I don't know, but I feel good. <laughs> and I'm not saying we don't need those things, but what I'm sharing is to make a change, you have to have uh, knowledge. There's got to be someone that speaks to the mind because only through speaking to the mind can you make change. And I was inspired by the Lord to share some things that can help you if you're really serious about growing your ministry. A lot of people talk about growing ministry, but they're not really serious about it. And that's the reason why we say the gym conference. Gym 
is an acronym, Grow Your Ministry, because if anybody want to build muscles, they just can't sit home and then wish that muscles will happen. Nor can they just take a pill and then all of a sudden muscles appear. And if they do, that means they're on steroids. <laughs> which have some other negative results. All right. But if you really want to grow uh, your muscles and get in good physical condition, guess what? You've got to work at it. All right? And the same principle is true that I want to share is that if you want your ministry to grow, either individually or church, an auxiliary, you've got to work at it. Look at somebody say, work at it. Okay. So that's the reason why the Lord inspired me, because I want to share some things here with you in a minute, to make an impact. Not just an impression, but an impact. I shared on Sunday uh, with the saints in ministering, uh, Amaris and Dave, they got married on a destination uh, wedding, then they got married in the Bahamas. Beautiful setting. Oh, I'm so glad that we did it then and not this week with all the hurricanes coming. God was good to us. But the setting was right in front of the ocean. Uh, it was a gazebo right on the beach. And then afterwards, they took some pictures right with the oceans coming in. And so you, if you've ever been to the beach, when you walk and you put your foot in the sand, you have a, tr a fantastic imprint uh, of, of your foot, especially if you're out there barefoot. And you look back and you see, wow, that, your foot is there. But the moment a wave comes, that footprint is gone because it was an impression. Impressions are not always permanent. Stay with me. What do you mean? Sometimes we make decisions on impressions without really knowing what's behind it. Many people got hooked up with the wrong person because that person impressed them. Well, somebody gonna hear me. But then after you got home and got married, uh, the impression was gone and you saw what really was there. But an impact is when there's been a change. All right? And that's the desire to have an impact. Okay? Uh, the Lord inspired me to develop a leadership conference that even though all can benefit, it is specifically designed for smaller ministries seeking to grow. Time for the Gym is a conference for church leaders that focuses attention on principles and training for those leaders with limited resources or just starting a ministry. Of course, I've attended and even participated in a number of leadership conferences. And sometimes when you go to very large conferences, and we've been to some all over the country, when you come home from those conferences, sometimes you get depressed. I wish I had a witness out there. Because you say now, they was able to do all that they did, but they had the money, they had the people, they had the resources. And then you come home and you see the same people sitting in front of you. <laughs> Amen. Now when you was there, oh my, you had dreams, you had visions, you was writing stuff down left and right. Then when you got home and you, and you got back on that Sunday and looked out in the congregation, the same people were there. And then you kind of got depressed. Lord, what can I do? Stay with me. So, that's the reason why the Lord impressed upon me for this specific conference, Grow Your Ministry. And uh, here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. According to a new study from the Hartford Institute 
of religious research, most American churches now have less than 100 in weekend worship attendance. And this is according to Facts and Trends, February 24th of this year. All right, so most American churches have less than 100 people attend on their weekend services. Stay with me. Almost 58% of U.S. churches do not reach triple digits on the weekend. That means 100 or more. And the 2015 report states that declines now encompasses all, somebody say all, all denominations. All right? And what you're seeing as a trend is now many millennials, and those are between the ages of about 20 and 35, have become disillusioned with church. All right. And that's why a number of our uh, sessions are dealing with millennials. God has uh, given us a key in reaching that particular age group. Uh, as you know, uh, Hillary Clinton was basically the only candidate for the Democratic Party until the millennials put their uh, 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 confidence behind uh, Bernie. And with just the millennials, listen, giving an average of $16 almost put Bernie in the Democratic position because of their influence, their power, and their ability to network. We've got to figure out how to tap into that for the church. Okay? So, let me share some things with you. I was elected pastor on June 6th of 2009. That's just seven years ago, a little over seven years ago. The votes that were cast in that election were 77. 42 for myself, 35 for the next candidate, and another candidate should have just stayed home. <laughs> they just put their name in the running. Now, even though it was 77 votes cast, as you know, when an election comes, people then come from out of nowhere that are not there on a regular basis. Do I have a witness out there? Right. So, on the day it was elected. So, I, I, I'm, I, I came to pastor church between 50 and 75 members. I was in Youngstown as the assistant pastor to Bishop Wagner. I was the senior, most experienced person on staff. I was the chief of staff, had a corner office. Uh, we lived in a four bedroom home. Angela was full time working as a nurse then. Had a staff, et cetera. And we got a couple here, here from Youngstown. I'm glo so glad to see a uh, good, good son of ours, Nathan Brantley, is here tonight. This is Bishop Brantley's nephew and also Bishop Wagner's nephew, cousin, somewhere, somewhere in the bloodline. Hallelujah. And uh, another one of our great members is here, Jane Colton, who was now in Washington, D.C. But uh, I was pretty much in line to become the next pastor there at uh, Mount Calvary. But in June 9th, uh, June 6, 2009, Pastor, uh, I felt led to leave New Bethel, uh, I'm sorry, leave Mount Calvary and come to New Bethel to pastor. I had to take a pay cut. Uh, we moved into an apartment, stayed in an apartment for several years. But my heart and desire was to please God. And when you're in ministry, you don't mind serving. 
some of you who have Facebook, I put on the other day, even in the preparation of getting this place ready, my wife was out here working. First lady of the church working in the church. I'm talking about physically working. It was our heart. It was our desire. Stay with me. All right? Now, six months later, a bishop came in October, laid hands on me, and consecrated us as into, the, uh, into the pastorate here at New Bethel. That I was elected in June. He came the weekend in October. Same weekend, my mother had just passed that same weekend in Youngstown. So I was trying to make funeral arrangements because I was the only child and still get ready for the transition. Okay. He came, uh, laid hands on me, Bishop Horace Smith preached the message. He was a diocesan at that time. That's in October. January of 2010, Bishop Wagner makes his transition to heaven. Unexpectedly. He was only like 68 years old. And, and unexpectedly, God called him home. Now when that happened, a lot of people were saying, oh, Bishop Brady's going to go back to Youngstown. The saints here at Bethel got nervous. <laughs> Many of them got nervous. Because it looked like can I teach you a little bit? And, and, and that's why I'm here to, to share some things and impact you through teaching. So many thought, even across the country, oh, he's getting ready to go back to Youngstown. Look, but my position is this. Because God knows all things, come on, he's uh, omniscient, he knows all things, Knowing he was going to take Bishop Wagner home in January, why would he have ever had me come pastor six months before? It would have been logical that if I was to become pastor, to have remained there. Now, would somebody hear me? So that there would have been a smoother transition. But six months before... God takes him, he moves me to Kansas City, Kansas. And at that time, the only thing I knew was Dorothy and Toto. It was Toto, wasn't it? All right. I'm going somewhere with this. Hallelujah. I'm going somewhere with this. But God is in control. Look at somebody say, God's in control. If God calls you, if God sanctions you to move into a ministry, he will show his hand. And if God is doing it, you don't have to politic. You don't have to try to kiss up on somebody. You don't have to try to, uh, 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 oh, help me, Holy Ghost. God will do it. So, I remained here even though many said we were going back. From a church that had well 1,500 or more members, private school, uh, senior citizens complex. You all, some of y'all know. And I was here at New Bethel. But I knew this is where God sent me. Don't listen to people to push you into something. Because many people will push you and say, oh yeah, we're going to be with you. And you'll turn around and can't find a thing. But if God has pushed you into something, called you into something, you don't have to rely on people. God will show his hand. So, 2010. Let me just show you something here. 
since being pastor. In 2014, just two years ago, the new members that came in that year was 133. We baptized 88 people in Jesus' name, and 69 were filled with the Holy Ghost. In 2015, 167 new members, 102 people were baptized in Jesus' name, 61 filled with the Holy Ghost. And this year, uh, just this year, I'm sorry, uh, uh, as of last Sunday, we have 105 new members, 64 baptized, and 45 people re receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> right now, according to our data, because we use Servant Keeper as the software that we monitor, we have over now a thousand plus members that have come through the church. Listen, 60% are women and 40% are men. If you have a chance and you walk down this hallway, we put pictures up of all new members on a billboard or, or, or a display case. We do that so people can see the new members coming in, but also is there to help us, even me sometimes, remember what, what their names are. We've averaged 150 new members every year since I've been pastor, which means that even though we started with 77, in seven years' time, God has blessed us to be a close to 1,000 members. <laughs> now, that did not just happen. Number one, we needed the favor of God. And I alluded to it in the video, we have an early morning prayer. If I'm in town every Sunday since I've been pastor, I lead the morning prayer. I got that from our pastor who, we used to have a six o'clock prayer service every Sunday morning for a whole hour. And he would come and pray and I learned principles. While other people were trying to imitate his style of preaching, I wanted to understand the principles of what made him successful with God. And those were the things that I learned to apply in my role as pastor. So this week, we want you to be challenged. And, and of that thousand, I think our largest percentage group of, of members in the church are millennials. Millennials are the largest percentage. So we have constructed a, a, a conference designed under the theme from the pew to performance. And, and I'll explain our, our, uh, what we're using as a uh, display, what this means. Because I'm sure some of you are wondering, why is that pew sitting up in here? Well, you'll see in a minute. We're talking about from the pew to performance. Helping us this week, uh, Bishop David Cooper, he'll be speaking tomorrow evening. Uh, he's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Great, great minister, great leader. And he'll also be uh, doing something in the afternoon. Dr. Sheila Austin, tremendous woman of God, who's also the dean of the educational college at the University of Auburn in Montgomery, uh, in Alabama, rather. And then our own Pastor Darren Thomas is going to be here on Friday. Now, Dr. Austin is only going to be speaking in the general sessions during the day, tomorrow and Friday. And then uh, Bishop Cooper and, and Pastor Thomas will be doing something in the evening as well as something during the day. That's why you've got to get registered and be here to benefit from uh, what they were going to provide. Today, uh, I'll be talking about when you are not the one on stage, and then tomorrow, uh, we'll be dealing with from the pew to performance, innovative methods to engage young adults, 
The Lord is looking for you, a true worshiper. Time for your renaissance. The force be with you, again, dealing with the millennials. Uh, do you really want your church to grow? And then tomorrow evening, moving from pain to purpose. So these are the sessions that we have on tomorrow. Now, some of you who've come from different locations, you've got several people. It would be good that you divide yourself up so that everybody can benefit and receive something from what is being taught. Then on Friday, uh, sacred calls to secular places. Pew performance means home performance. There's a whole world waiting for you that deals with social media. Get off the bench, it's your time. Who says you can't do that in ministry when your grip seems to be letting go? That's for men only. Season for the season. Now, we uh, changed the original program. That season for the season is going to be for pastors and pastors' wives. And it's going to be a question and answer period for uh, you with, with myself and First Lady Angela Brady. That in a more intimate s a setting, if there's some things you want to ask or share, we'll be there. And that's going to be for pastors and their wives. And since this is for men, when your grip seems to be letting go, we did add a third seminar on Friday that's going to be for the women only. And what is the name of that, uh, that session uh, that we added on Friday? Um, I know uh, Dr. Tammy Combs is teaching it, um, and I don't see her in here at the moment. What is it? Uh, no regrets. I was made for this. But it's in your book. We added that on Friday just for women only. Okay? And then uh, my worship belongs to you with uh, Pastor Darren Thomas. Uh, other guest presenters, Pastor Eric Cobbins. He's a pastor, excellent pastor here in the city. He's, uh, he's going to be teaching one of those sessions. And then we've got New Bethel presenters. All those that are from New Bethel, they will help in the pre presentation. And then I share with you also the coordinator, Elder LaShawn Relaford. Now, during this conference, I want you to remember these things. Number one, what does this say? Listen. listen. Listen not just to the speaker, but listen to God. Listen to the Spirit. Okay? Number two, what does this say? I cannot overly emphasize the power of taking notes. All right? How many have ever had a dream and then you knew you had a dream, but when you woke up or when you came conscious, you forgot what it was. Instead of taking a note to keep it fresh, because you will lose it, okay? So take notes. And then something we don't often do, what is this word? Meditate, meditate. When you go back to your hotel rooms or when you're in some quiet time, uh, meditate. And let the Lord begin to share with you uh, brainstorm ideas and things in your spirit. When I go to conferences, I know that maybe everything that is being taught will not apply to me and my local church. And the same is true. We're throwing everything out there that has made us successful. But maybe some things do not apply to your locale. You got to hear what the Lord is saying for you. Amen? And then last word, lastly, uh, what's that word? Network. Network. Get to know one another. Uh, maybe somebody from Ohio has an answer that you need in California. Or somebody from Missouri uh, might have an answer that you need in Minnesota. So while you're here, uh, network with one another and I'm sure you'll be able to glean and benefit. Now let's go into our lesson for today, okay? Uh, which is entitled, When You Are Not the One on Stage. We're talking about from the pew to performance, okay? What happens when you're not the one that's doing the teaching or the preaching or the leading the song? You're not the one on stage. You know what really irks me? 
is when somebody's preaching and the congregation is behind them and you got some preachers behind them just picking their fingernails, looking all off into the air, won't stand up, won't even say hallelujah, and if they do, it's hallelujah. But when they're the ones preaching, they want everybody to stand up, give five high fives, turn around, do somersaults. But when somebody else is on stage, when it's somebody else's time to shine, then it's as if they have no desire to support. Now I must, I must forewarn you, I am going to just share some things and people know that I'm just gonna speak my heart. I don't always do things politically correct. No, I'm not Donald Trump, but I still do not always do things politically correct. I believe we need to have truth taught and not try to always cover some stuff up. And the reality is we need to challenge some things as opposed to grinning in somebody's face but then talking behind them at Denny's at the midnight coffee break. Amen. So, this session is going to deal with developing and supporting others to fulfill their ministry. Somebody say, their ministry. Yes. You're, you, you, that means God's called you to help somebody else. All right? Uh, you cannot move others to perform if they are not given the opportunity to serve. Often it takes greater strength and skill to be a supporter to those who are headlining in ministry. You see, remember I told you about my relationship with Bishop Wagner. I was an assistant. We, if Bishop, I was, I was in my 40s and 50s, if Bishop said hit the floor, I was outlaid. Even if I had a brand new suit. Because we loved him so much, we knew that we were there to support him. And many people, it's been said all over the country, Bishop wouldn't even give a physical sign. He might just nod his head and the staff would know exactly what was needed. That's because we had his heart. We were around him so often that if we saw an eyebrow go up, we knew what that meant. Then people would wonder, how do they know to do that? Because we were assistants. Stay with me. Some people have left their call in trying to, 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 to minister and be the lead when you've been called to be the assistant. Now, can you imagine I'm in my 40s? People were saying, you need to go past your own church. Why are you still under Wagner? You need to be doing your own thing. They just say Bishop Wagner, Wagner. <laughs> but I knew my calling. Come on. And it's amazing that six months before uh, a bishop is transported to heaven, I'm called to another location. Could it have been that God, knowing I was going to call Bishop home, that my assignment as an assistant was over? Now you had to move into a lead position. I wish somebody hear me. But while you're assisting somebody else, you be the best assistant there is. We got so many people who are trying to be leaders and pastors, but they don't know anything about serving. But, but in, in the movie industry, they don't give Oscars just for lead actors. They give Oscars for the best. Denzel Washington got his first uh, 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 Oscar as the best supporting actor before he got his Oscar for being a best actor. You have to know when your time is and the call on your life. 
I wish somebody say amen. amen. So, 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 uh, 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 often it takes greater strength and skill to be a supporter. What does that mean? Because sometimes you've got some things inside of you and you're just itching to get it out and seem like nobody is listening to you. Nobody's giving you the door uh, of opportunity. And it's hard to sit somewhere where you feel as if God's moving you. But the key is timing. Somebody say timing. timing. I had many a program. I remember giving something to Bishop and I had a detail typed out, uh, gave it to him. It was called uh, Abundant Life Seminars. And I said how we can have a day of teaching and impact people. He looked at it and said this is good and then put it in his bottom drawer and closed it. <laughs> and we never implemented it. But God later said, I gave that to you, not to Bishop Wagner. And while you thought it was the time to implement it, there was another time that God wanted you to implement it. And, and consequently, that catapulted our teaching ministry throughout Europe, the Abundant Life Seminars. So, just because, say, your pastor or your leader doesn't always acknowledge something you presented, was it for them or is God saying, no, hold this for when I put you in place? So when you support somebody else, it doesn't make you less significant. Instead, it is through the ministry of support that you discover your assignment is to help push your brother and sister to fulfill the dream of God for their lives. Okay, let's, let's, let's keep moving. These are four areas that I want to deal with when it relates to uh, when you are not the one on stage. Now tomorrow in the morning, I'll be the first one to address the general session and I'm going to deal specifically talking about from the pew to performance. And you'll see uh, how this that we have as a display is going to be applicable. But when you're not the one on stage, these are the four areas I want you to consider. Uh, number one, know yourself. Number two, developing the right team. Uh, number three, check your motives. And then lastly, preparation for succession, okay? So let's move uh, with the first one, uh, know yourself. In the book of Galatians, and I'm using the New Living Translation, okay, we'll, we'll start, uh, Let's start with the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, New Living Translation. Look what it says here. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, this is Paul talking to the church at Rome. I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. One of the things that you have to remember uh, when it comes to knowing yourself is you've got to know your strengths and your weaknesses. But more specifically, uh, You've got to know your place. It's understanding your call of God. Stay with me. When you know you're in the place God's called you, it changes your mindset that you're not intimidated by somebody else who knows what their call is. 
But when a person is insecure at who they are, they then can't adapt to somebody who is confident in who they are. You've got to know yourself. When you know yourself, come on now, and you know the power that God's given you, you know the anointing, you know the favor, you know the call on your life, then you don't have a problem with celebrating somebody else in their greatness. <laughs> you can sit on a board, you can sit among pastors, you can sit among whatever, and because you know who you are, when you see God blessing somebody else, you don't get jealous, you get happy. But when you have an issue with who you are, when you see somebody else walking in their ministry that are being used by God in their call, sometimes that could be a little intimidating. And instead of rejoicing over somebody else's success, you then get a little jealous. You get a little envious. And instead of working to help, some listen, sometimes if you're not careful, you'll be on the sidelines hoping they fail. And it really gets bad if they're an agent to help you fail. Now you, oh, you say, oh, listen, I know what I'm talking about. People sometimes get upset when they see you being blessed and, and they're not being blessed. Can, can, can I share with you a secret? Uh, this is a secret. <laughs> but I'm going to tell it. This is a secret, I'm going to tell it. Have you ever had somebody change on you? You thought they were your friend, or they befriended you, but for whatever reason, down the road, it looked like they changed on you. Do, do I have anybody who knew what I'm talking about? Can I share with you a secret? Let me share with you a secret. There's some people who will be your friend as long as it appears they are in a better position than you. When it appears as if they got the thing going on and, and uh, they're there trying to help you who is struggling. And then they're your friend or they're, uh, they're your buddy. Uh, you know, the, they'll go out and uh, uh, you know, drink coffee together and because, because they'll let you know, you know, God's blessing me. You know, I'm, I'm in this place. I'm in this position. I got this. I got that. And because you don't have this, you don't have that, they enjoy having you around so that they can shine better. Let me share with you a secret. But the moment it appears that now God is blessing you and you have seemingly reached the same plateau or level they were at, and God forbid exceed where they're at, then you'll notice that they don't have that same relationship with you. No longer uh, do they consider you a friend. Now, here's the secret. I question whether they were a friend in the first place. Because a true friend does not get change on you when you become blessed. 
They're there to su support, celebrate, and help you even go higher, even when it's beyond them in that position. But there's some people who need to feel as if they're the superior one, so they got to have you around as a minion. Because it feeds into their psyche that I'm better than you. I wish somebody here with you. Somebody say amen. So this lesson tonight is for we who are leaders that you got to be careful to know who you are. That you don't allow something to creep in your heart when you see somebody else being blessed. See, I, I, I bless God. I bless God because at this stage in my life, I can honestly say I stand here and have nothing in my heart against anybody. A lot of people can't say that. I am not a hater. I've got friends and colleagues, especially in the bishopric. Ooh, some of them drive Bentleys. Some of them live in gated communities. Some got this, some got that. I am celebrating them. But because I don't have it, I don't hate on them. I wish somebody hear me. I, I'm happy with having what I have. And see, what I have, I can afford. What I have, I ain't got to worry about trying to trick somebody to get a hundred dollar line to keep my car payment. I can go home at night and be comfortable in the nice house God's given me. I wish somebody hear me. And my car is nice and gets me to my destination safely. So I ain't got to have a lot of bells and whistles and driving a big car and don't even have a garage to put on. So, so, so what am I saying is, listen, I honestly celebrate when somebody else is blessed. You cannot allow those things to enter into you because it'll take you away from your assignment. And, and, and part of your assignment is to support others. Am I helping somebody tonight? Okay, so look at the scripture here in, in, in um, Galatians. Uh, come on, let's all read this together. This is the, the, the New Living Testament version, Galatians 6.3. What does it say? If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not. See, I can drop the mic off. But this mic is too expensive to drop. <laughs> it's a shame, listen, to ever get to a place to feel as if something in ministry is beneath you doing. You are not that important. Our job is to help someone. Unfortunately, we can have an entire conference just on understanding what is the meaning of being a pastor. Because as was alluded uh, by LaShawn when he mentioned, it's about having a shepherd's heart. Most pastors don't know what it is to have a 
shepherd's heart. Because that's where the scripture comes to play. I laid down my life for my sheep. And there's a difference between a, a, a shepherd and a hireling. There's, please don't push me. Please, please don't push me. Oh, Lord. There are some people who would never be successful with a job but see easy money being a pastor. So we've got unequipped people handling the souls of individuals who have never been trained, only operating off of inspiration, and are killing people. And you know who I feel sorry for? The people who are following somebody who is not called to be in that position. Hear me. I can't disclose, of course, because of confidentiality, but I'm dealing with issues of pastors who, uh, and their congregations where uh, it appears as, well, I, I better not even say that. <laughs> Men and women in leadership must have a life of integrity. You must have a life of integrity. Not only that, listen, and I dealt with this even the message here at Bethel a Sunday. You, especially we who know the truth, you cannot compromise what you know truth is just to keep somebody in your church. And how can anyone have a deacon or somebody on their executive board who do not have the Holy Ghost but has a check? Well, I feel like slapping somebody. can a pastor, I'm talking about us, essence, allow or even condone somebody in the church living together and you know they're not married, but you need them to be your musician. I say, I, I already forewarned you. It cannot happen. Not if you're going to be a man or a woman of integrity. Even if the word is hitting your mama upside the head, mama's head has got to be hit. She said, help mama. And, and, and while I'm there, let me hit this. I, I'm going to be finished here in a minute. But this is my heart. This is my passion. This is what I, I pray that the teaching will help in all aspects for you to make a change. Impact. Uh, let me share this. Sometimes churches are comprised of a major family component. And you're fearful to, and, and see, one of the family members uh, keeps the books. And money's been missing. Now, 
Now, I'm out there. Can I keep on going? You're in a bad position that you are fearful to say something to that person thinking that they, if they leave, that whole family component is going to leave the church. Now we're laughing, but it's true. We give a blinded eye to some people because of the influence they have in our congregation. Somebody say amen. So, so in ministry, knowing yourself, and let me, let me move on here. But, but this is the reason why I have this passion. Because I believe things that you'll learn this week can help you if you're serious about growing your ministry. Now let me take a sidebar right there. Many people talk about growing, but they're not really serious about growing their ministry. So don't edge me on. Don't, don't edge me on. Have you ever heard some people say, oh, the big churches never help us little churches. No one ever comes to help us. We need help. No one ever comes to help. Oh, they just thinking about themselves. Then you have conferences, seminars, forums, bringing people from all over, pay all the expense for people to come in to bless you, but they don't show up. And sometimes they don't want to know. Because the moment you know, you're held accountable. See, as long as you're saying nobody's helping us, it justifies why you're not doing anything. But the moment that you're exposed to something that can help you, now that means you've got to show some results and you can't blame somebody else. I wish somebody say amen. amen. Some people are not serious about growing ministry. Amen. But I guarantee that if you're desirous, things can change. Okay, next one is developing the right team. We're talking about when you are not the one on stage. Okay, I along with others teach this, but that I teach a specific course that's entitled, It Takes Teamwork to Make the Dream Work. Ephesians 4.16, the Living Bible Version says this, under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly, and each part in its own special way helps the other parts so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. All right. No one can ever feel as if, we're talking about when you're the, not the one on stage, you cannot feel as if it's only going to be you that does it. You need a team. That means you need others to uh, provide input and share. Stay with me. Michael Jordan, for those of my age, LeBron James, for those that are younger. These were fantastic athletes within themselves. But they could not win a championship just on their skill alone. They had to have the team. And it wasn't until Chicago's management surrounded Michael with formidable players and and LeBron went to Miami that was surrounded with formidable players that they moved beyond their personal skills to championship winning. In a church, you need to have others to get you to your destination. 
And the moment you think that it's only you that can do it, you're ready for a fall. That means you've got to have the team. Now, again, even with this conference, I have put in training and input into staff and others that now I don't have to try to do everything. There was a time where I felt as if I had to do everything till it got on other people's nerves. But now, listen, I'm getting older. I'm 60 years old. So I can't always do everything that I used to do when I was younger. You get to be wise to understand that you got to surround yourself, and, and I'll talk about it tomorrow, God has given you as leaders gifts in your church. But are you using your gifts or have you put them up in the cupboard with all the other wedding gifts that you got that you've never used? Stay with me. Okay, so you got to develop the right team. Next, check your motives. All right? And I dealt with that uh, briefly already about checking your motives. You've got to make sure that you are uh, held accountable. Let, let, look at the scripture in Proverbs. This is the uh, New Living Testament version. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like what? Cancer in the bones. I'm talking about when you are not the one on stage. You've got to be careful that you don't let some jealousy get in there. How come they got to preach? How come this person was made a district elder? They ain't got nothing. Come on. And again, you used to be best of friends, but the moment somebody else gets that promotion, it's as if you don't need to, you don't want to know them anymore. Jealousy. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And what do you put in the grave? Dead things. So you got to check your motives. Talking about when you're not the one on stage. Check your motive. Are you uh, wondering how come that's not me? And then are you looking cross-eyed at the person that God used using at that season? If you're in God and he's called you, your time will come. And when God elevates you, no man can bring you down. Stay with me. Be careful of people who offer you big money to be a part of their ministry. Because if it's not God motivated, what happens if the money dries out? Or if you cross the person who's giving you the money. I wish somebody hear me. See, sometimes when you sign contracts like that, you are just like a military person. You have sold your life to somebody. But did God tell you to do that? Check your motives. Check your motives. Here's another scripture, uh, uh, Romans 12, 15. L look at this. This is so good, uh, the Living Bible Version. Come on, read this with me. I'm almost finished. Read this with me. What does it say? When others are happy, be happy with them. If they are sad, share their song. Work happily together. Come on. Don't try to act big. This is Paul telling the church at Rome. Look what he says. Don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ooh, and don't think you oh, 
<laughs> See, sometimes you got to read other versions to get the real meaning of what you're, you're looking at in the old King James Version. He makes it very clear. Check your motives. Don't try to act big. Some people change when they get a title. Some people change when they get a little position. Don't try to act big. One of the things that has blessed us is my wife and I, we have never lost touch with the people of New Bethel. We believe that everybody that comes through the door is important. There's no big eyes, no little U's. All of us, when you come in, you're part of the family. Somebody say amen. Stand up, stand up, Rita. Here, here's Rita Burkholder. Now, Rita and I have different hues. <laughs> she was a pastor. Had some challenges in another denomination. She's an educator. She's a teacher. One of her students, who was a member, a member here, was doing a solo. She came as a teacher to support her student singing a solo. Got here and the Holy Ghost got a hold of her. <laughs> and the Lord has blessed her tremendously that now She's part of the ministerial staff here at New Bethel, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost. And even though she's a different color, we still consider her a sister like everybody else. And she'll tell it she grew up in a family that was Ku Klux Klan. Oh, God, you heard it change. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But I am, listen, I am so godly proud, and, and everybody is treated the same way. Everybody. Uh, 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 that... There should never be in the church a, a, a big I and a little you. Or you can't touch somebody or, 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 or engage with somebody. Ooh, how, how can you be an effective pastor and as soon as the message is out, you gone back to your office, you ain't touched nobody, ain't called nobody, ain't, ain't, ain't concerned about anybody. I'm sorry, I'm gone, I'm gone to Midland, all right. Check your motives. Somebody say, check your motives. Check your motives. All right. And then the last one for tonight, and then we'll uh, uh, be dismissed and have our reception. Has anybody been blessed already in this first session? This is just the beginning. It is, it, I'm telling you, it's going to be powerful. Uh, the speakers that we have, the subject matter that you're going to leave here, I pray, with a greater understanding and knowledge of resources to uh, uh, cause you to grow. The last area I want to deal with this and it will be uh, dismissed is this. When you're not the one on stage, sometimes you've got to prepare for others to take your place. When I... Uh, became pastor, I had like a 15-year plan. <clears throat> the first five years, training and educating, uh, building a new foundation. The next five years, a time of growth. And then the last five years, a period of preparing somebody to take the ministry to the next level. God hears me. I have no inclination of being a pastor where I'm so old <laughs> that somebody got to lead me up to the pulpit.
and then lead me back. You know what happens? All the work that you build is going to die. Because how can a person survive or live spiritually in that environment when the pastor hardly can remember what his name is? But out of respect, no one will remove him, but keep him in that position, or her in that position, and their season has been over. And here's the sad part about it. Jeff, they never prepared anyone to succeed. And when that happens in this chaos, because you got all kind of people trying to get in, but I want to show you something in the scripture. This was very powerful to me. Um, Moses, I'm, I'm giving in, because I, I can teach all night. I, teaching is, is who I am. Moses failed God. When the Lord told him to speak to the rock and he smote the rock. Now the first time he was in that same place, in that same situation, God told him to smite the rock. Back in the same place, same situation, this time God tells him to speak to the rock. But he was unwilling to change. He resorted back to what he did before. And God says, I cannot have a mentality of slaves in the, the promised land. So I got to get somebody else to take the people into a new land. I was somebody here. When, because the moment, if you read the scripture, I'm going to show part of it and you can read, research it. The moment that Moses smote the rock, immediately God called him and Aaron and said, come here. You failed to keep my word. Consequently, you will not go into the promised land. I'll let you see it. Can you imagine? 40 years dealing with some hard-headed saints. And then fail to go into the promised land. God said, I'll let you see it. All he could do was see it. Saints, I don't want to just see it. I want to possess everything God has for me. I wish, I wish somebody put a praise on that. I don't want to just see it. I want to possess it. What God has put in your spirit is dreams and visions. Don't let somebody cause you to miss your dream. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so so here, here's, here's a scripture I want you to see. Go, in fact, go to, if you have your Bibles, let me just give you a little bit of background. This is my last a slide for today. Go to Numbers, chapter number 27. Come on, very quickly, you have your Bibles. See, I was good. I was good to you because I put the scriptures on the board. I didn't have you use your Bibles. Get your scriptures. And some of you don't be faking it, looking it at the phone as if that's your scripture. You know you don't have a Bible app on there. You get your, you get your phone out, start looking. You know you don't have no Bible app. I've been in the way a long time. I know us. All right, Numbers chapter, I want you to see something. Go to Numbers, and let's pick it up at chapter number 27. And we're going to just read a few scriptures. And you, I know you have the King James Version. That's, that's fine. Come on. Verse number 12. I want you to see something here. This is the last, last slide. Verse number 12. 
The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mountain, Abram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Verse number 13 uh, says, And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. Verse 14, everybody please read. Verse 14, what does the scripture say? For, you For you rebelled against my come When I told you to speak to the rock, you smote the rock. You rebelled against my commandment. If God tells you to do something, you don't have any right to try to do it the way you want to do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, God. And don't be motivated by what you think people uh, want you to do or expect you to do. Somebody might fall in sin and God says, give them grace. And somebody else do the same exact thing, if not uh, a lesser, and says, uh, uh, silence them or put them in a position where they cannot work men ministry. You cannot question God. God doesn't have a, a rule for everybody because God gives grace to each person based upon their knowledge of who he is. There's no could cookie cutter position God deals with people individually and as a pastor you got to be able to hear God for every situation I don't know why the Lord just told me to use that as an example God told him to, to speak to the rock but he rebelled Woo, help us not to rebel what God is telling us Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. The Lord will tell you, go apologize to somebody, and they were the ones that offended uh, you. You cannot take that, I'm not going to say I'm sorry, they did, unless they come tell me. What did God tell you to do? I know I was right. That so-and-so, he shouldn't have done it in the first place. She shouldn't have said anything. And you want me to go? <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Uh, uh, verse 14, what does the Bible say? For you rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin. Come on, in the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. Now, drop down to verse number 18. Well, Moses then, look, verse 15, I want to rush here. Moses then said to the Lord, Let the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Moses said, God, okay, I'm sorry. But please, whatever you do, get a man over this congregation that will carry the people to their place. Verse number 17, which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Moses said, oh God, I'm sorry, but please, you're going to replace me. Make sure, Lord, you choose a person who has a shepherd's heart. Stay with me. Moses, look, look, Moses did not select who his successor was. Moses had sons. His sons weren't even considered to replace him. Because cause, cause he said, Lord, Make sure whoever you put over the people has a shepherd's heart. Stay with me. Now there were two that were Moses' assistants. Joshua and Caleb. When they were young and were spies, remember, and they went out, only Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report. And when all the people, stay with me, 
When all the people said, oh, they were the, the other spies. Oh, there's some good stuff over there. But we saw men, there were giants in the land, made us look like grasshoppers. Who was the one to speak up and say, we can take them right now? Caleb. Joshua didn't say a word. Caleb said, we, we can go up there right now. Now, most people would have thought Caleb would have been the best one to be the leader. Joshua didn't answer. Caleb said, right now we can go up and take them. It's not always the one who appears. It's who God says. Let me share something else. God is so beautiful. Remember Joshua and Caleb. You can only have one leader at one time. Now, all these years, Joshua and Caleb have been the support system to Moses. Moses is getting ready to leave. But look who's called. I'm going to say, come on, come on, let me hurry up, let me hurry up. <laughs> look who's called. I'm going somewhere with this. Look, look, look. Verse number 18, Lord, please select somebody who has a shepherd's heart. Verse number 18, come on, very quickly, please read. What does the Bible say? The and the Lord said unto Moses, what? Take, the Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and do what? First of all, we have lost the principle of understanding what the power is in laying on of hands. There is a divine transfer when you lay your hands. That's why the scripture says, lay hands on no man suddenly. You cannot always transfer something into somebody else because you don't you could be blessing a devil. You're anointing and blessing a devil. Lay hands on no man suddenly. It's a transfer. He said, now you got to transfer. Uh, and, and I got further scripture and Exodus to back me up, but I don't have time to, to, to prove it. But lay hands. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Look. Verse number, verse number, verse number uh, uh, 19. Come on. What does the Bible say? Please read. Come on. Read with me. And set them before Eleazar the priest. What? And before all the congregation and... Give him a charge where? Yes. In their sight. To prepare for succession, you got to now put somebody else on the stage so that it's not just you being seen. You got to prepare the people for a transfer. Look how wise God is. Come on, here it is, verse number 20. Verse number 20, what? And thou shalt put. Some of thy honor upon him, come on, that all the congregation of children of Israel may be obedient to him. You put some of the honor on him, give him that authority, put him on the stage, come on, that while both of you are alive, I wish somebody hear me, that when now you're transferred out, now people are already used to this person in a leadership capacity. Now, getting back to Caleb. Because God did not want any confusion. Can you imagine for all these years, Caleb and Joshua have both been assistants to Moses, which means, no doubt, they had their favorite camps in the congregation. There were some that supported Caleb. There were some that supported Joshua. Hallelujah. Now Joshua is made the leader. So what do you think? Then those that support Caleb would not necessarily give Joshua their full allegiance because they wanted Joshua to be the, 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 the head. How did God handle that situation? When they were getting ready to go over into the promised land, Caleb looked at a mountain on the other side of Jordan and said, Lord, 
give me this mountain. Which means Caleb did not go into the promised land with Joshua. When Joshua established everything, Caleb was out of the picture so that there'd be no confusion as to who really is the leader. Don't always get upset when somebody's leaving. Sometimes God is setting things up for greater blessings. When you are not the one on stage, if you've been blessed tonight, come on and give God a praise. We pray that you were blessed and encouraged by this message. To receive additional information about Bishop A. Glenn Brady and the New Bethel Church, log on to www.newbethelkc.org or call the church office at 913-281-2002. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at New Bethel KC. Until next time, be blessed. Thank you.